Hello, everyone. My name is Tammy Moring. I'm with the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. I'm so excited for having you all join us for our special community of learning event, Monarch Connections. We've been, uh, this is the second program for this three-part series that I'm so excited that we are able to be a part of. I'll let um, Learn Around the World and the Butterfly Pavilion kind of give you a little bit more details about that particular topic. What I just want to let you all know is that um, the chat is open for you to let us know where you are connecting from today. So definitely have that chat open at the bottom of your screen if you're on a desktop. Now, if you're on a mobile device, such as a tablet or a cell phone, you may have to tap at the top or swipe on over and you'll be able to find that. But let it um, open it up and have it ready to go. There's also going to be a quizzes link and um, for you and a QR code that you'll see up on the screen in just a moment when Brandon comes on for you to get ready to go so you can participate throughout the program in that way. So definitely have that ready to go. Just a reminder, students, make sure that all questions in the chat are connected to the program so that we can make sure we have respect for everyone involved. But at this time, I'm gonna hand it on over to my amazing presenters, um, Jillian and Brandon. You are more than welcome to take it away. All right, welcome everyone. As many of you have already started doing, go ahead and get logged into quizzes today. We're gonna be using this program once again on today's part two of Monarch Connections. If you're already logged in, well, we're gonna do a practice question or two. If you're not logged in yet, continue to do so. And we'll include that link right in your chat as well. But you go over to joinmyquiz.com, enter in today's game code, which is 819-229. You can play it right along and answer cool questions like this. <laughs> All right, if you're just joining us, two things. Go ahead and log into quizzes. You can see our last practice question here today before we start our virtual field trip on part two of Monarch Connections. Hey, would you rather be able to fly or breathe underwater? Let me know right now. Also, let me know in the chat, where are you watching from today? We'd love to give some shout outs here on the program. And going along with today's program and practice questions, hey, would you like to plant a Monarch way station? Yes, I don't know, no, or what is that? Well, we're gonna talk about it today. So shout out going out to Dominic in South Carolina. Uh, is joining us. Las Vegas is in the house. Alberta, Canada. Burlington, Ontario. Elon, North Carolina is in the house. Pembroke, Florida. Pembroke Pines. Cape uh, Carroll, Florida. Uh, Illinois is in the house. New Jersey is in the house. Mexico, Tennessee, Ontario, Ohio, Illinois. Folks from all around. That is so wonderful. On our theme of connections, we're going to talk about how all of these places are connected by monarch butterflies and by a very special plant today and that's going to be our clue for our monarch way station there again go ahead and get logged in if you're not yet already and we'll continue to get you logged in and going as we get going on our virtual field trip today so before we start uh welcome back everyone if you are a returner for this wonderful series monarch connections and if this is your first event with us well, no worries. These are each of these programs are designed to stand on their own, but we are connecting them uh, across what's actually going on in real time with the monarchs right now on Monarch Connections. Uh, if you missed last program, we talked all about monarchs in Mexico, brought to you by myself at Learn Around the World. And here at Learn Around the World, we like to promote global awareness through virtual field trips to wonderful places like Mexico to learn about monarchs and their overwintering sites. Uh, part two is today, 
which we partnered with the Royal Botanical Gardens. Unfortunately, Karen had an unexpected um, obligation she had to go to today. So the wonderful part about a collaboration, however, is we get to lean on each other and help each other out, just like you can help monarchs, as you're going to find out today. And I'm going to jump in and fill in for Karen today. So uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, we're going to talk a lot about habitats, but uh, please go out there, uh, look into uh, RBC's wonderful programs. If you want to know more about habitats and monarchs and with other habitats as well, they uh, are well, well more, can go well deeper into this topic than I could ever do. So please go check out their programs if you are interested in today. And then I'm going to throw it over to our other uh supporting co-host today, Julian, over at the Butterfly Pavilion. And she's going to give a little plug for our next program, going to be in a part three of our series. Hello, everyone. My name is Jillian. I'm visiting you from Westminster, Colorado, just outside of Denver. And I am so excited to be visiting you guys. If you haven't heard of Butterfly Pavilion before, we are in an invertebrate zoo, which means that all of our animals here at Butterfly Pavilion don't have backbones, just like our wonderful monarchs that we're following throughout this series. And in our third part, that's going to come in May, we're going to explore uh, other ways that you can get involved with monarchs. So extending on these habitat connections that Brandon's bringing us today. We're going to talk about the ways that you guys can become scientists yourself and engage with monarch butterflies throughout their migration across North America through community science programs. And that's going to be on May 14th. We'll send that link to register for that one in the chat as well. And looking forward to talking to you guys in more depth about the ways you can get involved with monarchs then. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're going to continue on with today's topic, talking about monarchs and habitats. Welcome all explorers. Let's do it. All right, thank you. Welcome back to Monarch Connections. So on today's program, we're going to continue where we left off on our part one, uh, where we learned all about the monarchs traveling down to Mexico to overwinter. Today, we're going to be talking about the habitat that ties that migration together. And we're going to be learning about what you can do to help out monarchs because they need our help. And we're going to be learning all about this very special plant uh, or plants, I should say, that you should be planting near your homes and how you can help. Hello, welcome back, everyone. My name is Brandon. You can call me Brandon or Mr. Brandon. I'm coming to you live from our studio located in Portland, Maine. So shout out to everyone watching from around the country today. This is our live cam right now in Portland and what it looks like at the Casco Bay over the water where I live at. But where do you live, explorers? Do you live over the water? Do you live in a place that's sunny today? Or is it raining? All of this matters, right? And it's going to matter today when we talk about habitats, because what I plant near my home it may be different from what you are going to plant near your home. And we'll talk about that today as well. A little bit more about my home as I tell you uh, as you think about yours, I'm coming to you from a place called the Dawnland, and it's been called that for over 10,000 years. You may have heard of some of these younger names uh, in the USA, like Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, or places over in today's Canada uh, and southern these other provinces like Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and southern Quebec. But before that, I've ever had any of these names, it's been home to the people of the water. Uh, Dong land, the Wabanaki peoples, and this is the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, and the Beneke peoples. This is the native land that I live on. This is my home where I live today. And what I need to think about when I'm choosing the plants I'm going to plant in my butterfly garden. But when you think about your home on Turtle Island, uh, AKA North America, right? You need to think about other plants. And if you want to know whose native land you live on, one of our favorite resources to always shout out here on our programs is native-land.ca. Come here, type in where you live or a place you're visiting, and you'll get a wonderful list of links and resources to your local tribes and nations. All right, let's go ahead and talk about where in our world are we talking about today? 
All right, so we'll do a little pop quiz. Maybe you remember this from our last show. And we'll go ahead and start using quizzes today. So as we refer to our world map, our first question on quizzes is going to be where? Where does the monarch butterfly go when they leave your home in the wintertime? All right. So as you're getting those answers in, where does the monarch go during the winter time? Well, they go to all of these locations. Kind of a trick question. In fact, some monarchs don't go anywhere at all. So not all monarchs migrate is the number one thing. But today we are going to focus on the migrating monarch because many of us today do live in the areas where they migrate to and leave every year. And so that's who we're going to focus on today. But do keep in mind, you're monarch. You're monarch. All right, so as we start talking about the monarchs, remember that the Western monarch goes to California during the winter time. The Eastern monarch goes to Mexico and some Florida, and some monarchs don't go anywhere at all. So if you live in a place that has their special habitat all year round, then you might not have a migrating monarch. So in Mexico, we learned on our last program, they come to these two Mexican states. They come to the state of Michoacan in the state of Mexico. We learned about these overwintering sites on our last program. Today, we're going to be focusing a lot on the migration and the habitats that ties everything together. The modern butterfly. So let's start talking about it, explorers. Habitats, right? What is a habitat? A habitat is a home of an organism that we're talking about, right? So if we're talking about a big elephant, that habitat may be a lot larger than maybe a small invertebrate that we're talking about, like the monarch butterfly. But the monarch butterfly has wings and it migrates over long distances. So when we talk about our habitats today, we need to tie that into the migration because the migration is going on all throughout Turtle Island. And... To talk about the migration, well, we have to talk about the life cycle. All of this stuff is connected, right? They're monarch connections. And all of these connections are connected by today's central topic, habitat. And it all starts with this very special plant of the monarch butterfly. Very special plant of the monarch butterfly. Hey, um, do you have an idea? Go ahead if you're participating with quizzes today. I'm going to do, give you our daily double today over on quizzes. And let me know right now, how many stages are in the monarch life cycle? We're starting off with life cycles so we can talk about migrations and so we can talk about habitats. Who knows how many stages are in the monarch life cycle? You can let me know right now on quizzes. All right, there are four stages to the monarch life cycle, four stages. So remember, a monarch butterfly is an invertebrate and they have stages to their life cycle. They're not like us. They're not born as a baby and get larger and larger and larger as they grow older. They go through four distinct stages throughout their lifetime. And you may have heard or seen of these before, right? Maybe compared to some other animals. So as a quick review, we're going to start with an egg. And then we talk about the larva or caterpillar and then the pupa or the chrysalis stage of the monarch butterfly. And then they have the adult butterfly. So these are the four stages of the monarch butterfly. And today, when we talk about habitats, a lot of it's going to lean on to this stage right here, the caterpillar stage, because the monarch caterpillar eats one food and one food only. Does anyone know what that one food is? And this is going to tie all of our habitats that we're going to talk together about today. You can let me know over on quizzes if you're playing along. What's that one special food? Does anyone know? All 
All right. So the one special food is milkweed. Today, we're going to talk a lot about milkweed, but I want to go ahead and pause right here because we're going to hear that over and over today. Milkweed, 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 milkweed is important. Milkweed, milkweed, it's important. However, we need to think about each and every one of these stages because monarchs need different things in different stages. So when you are creating your own monarch way station, you're creating your own habitat to help out the monarch butterflies because they need our help. When you're doing that at your school, at your home, in your community, you need to strategically think about each one of these stages to help them out. Because, yes, we need milkweed because we need to help out the caterpillar. But remember, right, there's other stages after the caterpillar. So they need other things as well. But milkweed is a key one, most definitely. So start thinking about that when you start doing these planning stages to help out the monarch caterpillar. And uh, and so let's get started and go back to the milkweed, right? Because milkweed is very important with that life cycle as we just talked about, right? The reason it's so important is because this is where mommy monarch comes and lays her eggs. Mommy monarchs are gonna lay about 300 eggs at a time, give or take. And they are very small. They're about the size of a pinhead. It's a little teeny, 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 weeny, beady egg. And you'll typically find them on the underside of monar or, sorry, of milkweed leaves. I almost said monarch leaves. And out of that caterpillar, or sorry, out of that egg, after about three days after it's laid, comes a little baby caterpillar. And that caterpillar first eats its own eggshell, but then it goes off and it only eats milkweed. It's going to grow about 2,000% in size. It's going to eat and eat and eat. How hungry is that caterpillar? Fantastic book, by the way. Right? So that caterpillar is going to be nothing but eat and eat and eat. And it's going to eat milkweed. So we need milkweed. So when we start talking about creating a way station, right? And a way station, think of it as a butterfly garden, right? And uh, when we start creating those, milkweed has to be a cornerstone if we're talking about monarch butterflies. Remember, there are other butterflies and I wanna give them love today as well, even though we're talking about monarchs. Uh, if you want to help other pollinators, right? Other pollinators, and this is important, uh, then you need to think about each and every species, not only the different stages, life cycle stages, but also what species are you trying to help? Today, we're focusing on, on monarchs, but there are other pollinators that we can help in our way stations as well. So maybe you can think about that as well. All right, so a monarch caterpillar uh, roughly is gonna be in this stage for about 10 to 14 days or so, about two weeks. After about two weeks of eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and eating, remember they're very hungry, they're gonna go into what's called a J-hang and then they're gonna hang there and go into their chrysalis stage, right? Stage three of the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. Um, this is really cool, by the way, if you've never seen this process, uh, when they go into a J-hang, Right. You can see why it's called a J hang there. Uh, and it, what you'll see is watch them closely because very soon they're going to be emerging into their chrysalis. And it actually forms under their skin. And this is really awesome if you've ever seen it before. And their skin actually splits on their back and they kind of shake out of it. Their head, their skin, all that falls off. And inside that chrysalis, they're going to be transforming, they're going to be changing into the adult butterfly. Remember, they grow in the caterpillar stage. And this stage is really awesome because they completely change into an adult butterfly and an adult butterfly is going to emerge. When you see the adult butterfly, they don't grow from a baby butterfly to a big butterfly. They come out full size. They don't grow in that stage. They grow in the caterpillar stage. And the whole process together, you may have heard this, maybe our younger explorers haven't heard it yet. One of my favorite science words, metamorphosis, right? Really cool when you said in different voices, metamorphosis, metamorphosis. It's a fun word. And in that process, when you're watching your chrysalis change from green to black, and it's gonna change kind of clear right before the adult butterfly emerges out of there. But once the adult butterfly emerges, right? Remember, they need different things. And so the adult butterfly, they need nectar plants. So when we talk about nectar plants, these are any plants that flower, right? They produce nectar. 
And that adult butterfly is going to go around from flower to flower and drink nectar from those nectar plants. So milkweed does flower. Milkweed does produce nectar. However, there are other plants that produce more nectar and different nectar at different times of year. So when we talk about nectar plants, we need nectar plants all throughout the season. And uh, if you want to help out the migration, we need that late summer, early fall nectar plants as well. Because when they go to Mexico, they don't eat all winter long. They need to survive on the nectar they eat on the way to Mexico. So especially if you live along that route to Mexico, right, it's very important that you have late summer blooming, early fall blooming nectar plants to help out and support that migration, right? So each one of these life stages are, are important to think about uh, what we're planning, right? So what habitat we're creating and what stage of the life cycle we are supporting and what time of year we're supporting those life cycles, right? Are, are we supporting the caterpillar or are we supporting the adult butterfly that's going around and drinking nectar with their proboscis, right? Another fun word. So if you ever seen that tall tube-like mouth of the uh, monarch butterfly, it is, you'll often see it curled up, right? But when they go drink that nectar, you'll see that sticking into the flowers to get to that nectar. Pretty cool adaptation of the monarch butterfly. All right, so these are the different life stages. And just for fun, in case you've never seen uh, one of them emerge, right? We're going to speed up a time lapse here. You can see that going from J hang to chrysalis, right? And then into our adult butterfly emerging, right? Out of that chrysalis, right? Pretty cool process. So again, we need to think about each one of these life stages and what time or what stage of the process we are supporting when we talk about what we're planning for the monarch butterfly. All right, so we're going to put all this together now, right? Now we talked about those life stages, right? We talked about, uh, now we need to talk about that migration, right? Everything tied together. And when we do that, right? So if we recall here, today we're talking about habitats and we just learned about some of those life cycles, right? Everything's tied together. Everything's connected together. But how about that migration, right? The migration, that's our word of the day, explorers. Migrate. What is a migration? Anyone know out there? So to migrate means to move from one area or one climate to another area. And different organisms, different animals do this for different reasons. Some animals do this for mating, right? They'll migrate to a different, to their mating grounds and then come back to the place they originated from. Some do it for feeding, right? So when we talk about, uh, if you look at uh, some of the great migrations across the African continent that are following grass, savanna lands that are they're following that food. Well, in a very similar way, our monarchs are following food. What are they chasing? They're chasing milkweed, right? The monarch butterfly is a tropical butterfly. Right? They, they have, many monarchs do not migrate at all. You find migrate monarchs all year round in uh, further to the south. However, what are they doing so far north? They're chasing milkweed, chasing milkweed. So when we create habitat for this migration, we need to think about where that migration is going and how we're supporting it, okay? So let's talk about this migration, right? It's all tied together through this. So uh, here's a fun thing to do. We've been talking for a while. Monarchs, Right, they, they flap their little wings, right? So they have cool adaptations for flying. They have wings. Do you have wings, right? If you're sitting back home, uh, and if you're in class, you can do this uh, activity to get loosened up with me. Uh, if you have a lot of room in your class, you can do big pterodactyl wings. If you don't have a lot of room, that's okay. Just a little, those little T-Rex wings like this, right? And I want you to flap your wings. Did you know a monarch, they can flap their wings uh, about five to 12 times per second. And so how many times can you flap your little wings? Hmm? How many times can you flap your little wings? Well, let's test you out. Remember, one second is one 1,000 stop. So I'm about to say on your mark, get set, go in a minute, but not yet. And I want you to see how many times you, we're going to go by trust here. So count your own, look around your classmates room, right? So a full flap is all the way down and back up. That's one, right? So not one, two, 
down and up is one. And I want to see how many times you can flap in one second. Everyone ready? Let's start in the top position with your little wings. I'm going to use uh, T-Rex wings myself. And are you ready? On three, one, two, three, go. One, one thousand, stop. How many did you get? Let me know right now in the chat. I got about four. I know some of you are going to say you got more than 12. But if you want to do the super duper challenge today at lunch, maybe you can go out with your friends and try to flap for a whole minute. See if you could beat 720 flaps. That would be 12 flaps per second for a whole minute. Wow, that's pretty awesome, right? All right, so I can see 23, 4, 5, 4, lots of different flaps. All right, so this migration, we just learned about different life, the life cycle, right? So we went from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to adult butterfly. All that together is one generation. We need to remember this migration is a multi-generation migration. What in the world does that mean? So if you're new to this big word generation, think one life cycle, right? So egg, those four stages, that's going all the way through that. That's one generation. Right. So just to help us think about that for a minute, think about you and your family explorers, your generation. So if you start with yourself and go to your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, your great great grandparents, five generations. How long is that for a human? 150, 200 years? It depends how long we live. But if we're going on an average of 70 to 80 to 90 year old humans, right, that's a long, long time. Right. Butterflies don't live that long. The adult butterfly of the monarch lives for about two to six weeks, right? So that means every year we get multiple generations. And this generation of the monarch butterfly typically happens about five to six generations within one year, if we think about butterflies and not humans, right? Except for one. There's one special generation every year. One of these generations, they're going to stop mating, stop laying eggs, and they're going to live for about eight to nine months. <laughs> that's, like, that's like us humans. Once every five generations, one of us one in our family lives for, I don't know, a thousand, you do the math, a long time, a lot longer than, uh, than it's typical, right? So we have four to five generations every year where the adult is living for about two to six weeks, and then one adult every year that's going to go to Mexico and go to the overwintering sites like we learned on our last program, wait out winter, right? They're just waiting for winter to be over. And then they're going to start back north chasing milkweed, chasing milkweed. And each generation after that is going to be chasing that milkweed. So how does this all work together, right? So when we start looking at the migration uh, together, uh oh, what's my thing doing there? So when we start looking at this migration together, how does it fit together? Well, let's bring it back onto our map here. So if we throw all the monarchs across Turtle Island here, and we know that they're going to California, we know they're going to Mexico, and some of them are going to Florida. Today, we're focusing on the Eastern monarch to Mexico. Well, why did some go to Florida and Mexico and some go to California, the ones way up north? Well, we have the Rocky Mountains kind of splitting those together. We got friends out in the Butterfly Pavilion over here somewhere in the Rockies. And... We are going to Mexico, right? So during that migration, right, our butterflies during the fall, they're going to start flying south, our monarchs. And some of them are going to go over 3,000 miles from places like Nova Scotia. Now, how do they get back to these same overwintering sites year after year? Because remember, it's a multi-generation. The last generation that came here was their great, 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 great grandpappy monarch butterfly. Did he leave a map? Right. So how do they get here? Well, we know they use something called a sun compass, right? They use the sun to go south is basically all it is. And then we have the Gulf of Mexico and the Rocky Mountains kind of funnel them down into Mexico. And then when they spend the whole winter, like we learned about, but that's, remember that one monarch that lives eight months, that's going to Mexico, flies the whole way, and then stays all winter and then starts back north. This is where we are right now in the year. They've already started back north. Now it's a multi-generation migration north. These adult butterflies that you're about to see wherever you live, our friends in South Carolina, you might have already seen them already. I haven't seen them yet. And that's because they haven't made it up to me in Maine. And I'm going to see a different generation than you are currently seeing right now. And that's because they're going to go through these four stages of the life cycle and keep going north. 
keep going north, right? And each of these stations, again, so when we plant our way stations, if you live in Nebraska or you live in Maine or you live in Ontario, right, what you're planting needs to be specific for your area that's going to be helping out the monarch butterflies, right? And so that's the migration, put it all together, and it's tied into this plant, right? the milkweed. So now we can tie it all together, explorers, milkweed, 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 right? So what's this milkweed stuff all about? Here, let's go to a local butterfly garden where I live. This is near, uh, across the street from an elementary school near my home. You can see a little caterpillar right there, monarch caterpillar. I go here every year and find caterpillars, and it's a fun process to watch them go through uh, the uh, life cycle. Now, if you choose to do this, it's highly recommended that you go out and collect uh, butterflies instead of ordering them offline. Better to use uh, wild ones instead of releasing lab monarchs out. However, when we think about monarchs, they are pollinators. So why should you care, right? You should care because they're pollinators. Pollinators, do you, uh, you may say, well, I don't care. Well, do you like fruit? Do you like almonds? Do you like blueberries like we produce up here in Maine? Well, you need pollinators to help those plants produce their fruit, right? So think about it, right? Stage four, the adult stage, when that monarch goes around from flower to flower and they're drinking that nectar from their proboscis, they're picking up pollen and spreading it around to other plants. And this benefits us humans, right? Well, what about what are we planting? So we need to plant in our butterfly gardens two primary plants, nectar producing plants, and milkweed. Ever wonder why it's called milkweed, right? It has that milky um, latexy. Um, uh, you can see when you open it up. Here's the interesting thing about milkweed. Uh, milkweed is the only plant, it's the only food of the caterpillar. And milkweed is a poisonous plant. Did you know milkweed's a poisonous plant? All right, we spent a while since we asked the question. So go ahead and grab your devices. We're going to do a, another daily double. We're going to do a review question here. Hey, does a monarch make a cocoon? Let me know right now. All right, so this one is often, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we get things wrong because we hear stuff all the time and we hear butterflies make cocoons. Monarchs make, remember, a chrysalis. They don't make a cocoon. Uh, so remember that one. That's a cool one to remember. And what about milkweed and monarchs? Are monarchs poisonous? All right, monarchs are actually poisonous. Now, here's the cool thing about all this, right? Unlike many other venomous and poisonous uh, organisms, so remember, there's a difference. If you bite it, it's poisonous. If it bites you, it's venomous. Little uh, rule of thumb there and to help you kind of remember, right? Snakes are venomous, not poisonous. So when we talk about monarchs, here's the cool thing about monarchs. They eat the milkweed. The milkweed is the actual toxin producer, right? They eat all this milkweed. And when they go into the chrysalis and go through metamorphosis and change into the adult, that adult retains some of these toxins in their exoskeleton. Pretty awesome, right? And because of that, the actual butterfly, the adult, they don't have a whole lot of predators, but they do have, there's a couple of birds that have behavioral adaptations, learn how to only eat out the insides, right? So they'll uh, bust into the abdomen and only eat the organs out because most of the toxins are in the exoskeleton. Remember, think like Iron Man, right? Hard on the outside, soft on the inside. Exoskeletons, unlike us, we have an inside skeleton, the exoskeleton, those invertebrates, right? Uh, that are wonderful friends of the butterfly pavilion is going to let us know a lot more about on our next program, but it's all related. So we're going to go ahead and talk about it a little bit here. And so what's really neat about this is there's actually a 
special type of camouflage. This is a Viceroy butterfly on the left. Anyone see the difference between the Monarch and the Viceroy? Don't they look very similar? So when we talk about different types of camouflage in the natural world, right, some types of camouflage are called mimicry. Pretty cool, right? You mimic, you yourself are not a venomous snake, but you look like another snake that's venomous, right? That's called mimicry. And many animals use this strategy, use this adaptation to help them survive. The Viceroy, you can see on the back wing, see this horizontal line here? Do you see that pattern on the right with the monarch? A little bit different, right? So pretty interesting. One of my favorite fun facts about them. All right. So when this milkweed, right, it's coming up in our gardens, right? And why plant milkweed? So what's going on, right? As we learned last time, our milkweed, right? The monarchs aren't doing well, right? The monarchs aren't doing well. In fact, uh, you can let me know. I just gave you the answer, but let's do a, a one last practice question over on quizzes here. And let me know, are they doing well? Because remember last time, if you were here in part one, then you may remember this answer, but the new numbers have just come out actually right after our last show. So we have some updated numbers to share with you today as well. Are the monarchs doing well? The migrating monarch, I should say. All right. So a lot of folks remember, right, they aren't doing that well. If you remember last time we talked about this, we won't go too deep into it today. But just remember, just know the higher the bar, the better, right? Uh, this is an actual monarch that's being counted, but it's how the area that has monarchs. So basically the higher, the better on the chart. And when we look at it here, the recent numbers just came out. This is the second lowest number in the past <laughs> ever since it's been recorded was this past winter, right? And we need to be up above this red line. We're way below uh, what scientists have deemed to be a healthy population at the overwintering sites in Mexico. So what's going on, right? And why should you care? Well, the reason why you should care, I saw in your chat, people that love strawberries and blueberries and all those fruits you put, right? They're pollinators, right? So at the end of the day, we need pollinators, right? Uh, the monarch has become a flagship uh, species for helping pollinators because so many people love monarch butterflies, and so do I. But overall, we need to help pollinators. But what's going on specifically with the monarch butterfly? Well, again, it's all tied to the milkweed, right? So there's a few things happening. Well, one, down in Mexico, there's a loss of habitat with deforestation. Not a lot you and I can do besides maybe finding organizations and nonprofits down in Mexico that's helping preserve habitat, then maybe donating money there. Um, that's one thing you probably could do from home. Uh, and then another big, big topic is climate change, right? That is affecting a lot of things. I'm sure you're familiar with that. That's a long, that's going to be a long uh, battle that we're all going to have to collectively take part in, right? But what's one thing you can do today, right? And the big thing is planting habitat for the monarch butterfly, because what's going on with the monarch butterfly? They have lost a lot of habitats where their milkweed used to grow. Here's the thing. Farmers have gotten really good today at growing the things they want to grow, right? So if I'm a corn farmer and you fill in the blank with any food you like to eat, but if I'm a corn farmer, I want to grow lots of corn. I don't want to grow a lot of weeds, right? And the more corn I can grow, the better for me and my family. Well, here's the downside to that. A lot of the milkweed in our country used to grow between rows of crops along the edges of fence lines. And with today's modern farming practices, a lot of that milkweed doesn't grow anymore, right? So here's where you can help out, uh, kind of pick up the slack in that area. You can plant butterfly gardens, way stations where you live, in your community, at your school, at your home, right? Where do you plant these? Maybe you live in a place, maybe you live in a city, maybe you live in an apartment. You're like, well, I don't have a place to put a garden, right? Well, let's start thinking outside the box a little bit, Explorers. So some of my favorite places, uh, this is near my home, right? Look at this place, all this empty grass right between this road. This is one of my favorite examples. Right. So this area, uh, areas between roads, little pockets of areas. Right. What good grass does do? You have to cut it. Right. So anytime you see a big grass area, this is a key uh, indicator that, hey, maybe that could be a great way station. In fact, 
If you want to participate, some resources we'll share with you today. Uh, one is going to be monarchwatch.org. Monarchwatch.org. What is monarchwatch.org? Monarchwatch.org is a great organization that gives you all kinds of information. They have a way station program, meaning they give you resources, tell you how to do it. They, uh, they have big maps here. Where do you live? Remember I asked you today, where do you live? If you live down here in Georgia, the milkweed you need to plant is going to be different than what I plant in Maine. If you live in Texas, your milkweed is going to be different than you're going to plant in Oregon. And even if you live in this special place, there's different species of milkweed. And by planting different species of milkweed, they flower, they grow at different times of the summer. So if you plant multiple species, that means you're creating a longer time period of habitat for the monarchs as they're migrating through your part of the world, right? So that's number one. Where do you live on this map? You can come here to monarchwatch.org find the map, and it's going to list your species of milkweed. What's really great about this organization, if you're a school or a library, they'll send you free milkweed, right? They'll send you free milkweed. All you have to do is fill out a quick form, and they'll send you free milkweed, and you can start doing this at your school. They recommend, they have a big, long list of recommended um, guidelines for way stations. One, if we go back and look at my example here, say if I wanted to create this one, and by the way, I took this photograph this morning. So uh, this one is not a way station right here. So one, they recommend you have at least, you can do it any size, right? Even little small uh, areas, you can have multiple small areas and overall together, they make a good area. But if you have a big area like this, uh, 10 by 10 is a recommended smallest space, 100 square feet, that's not that big. Uh, and they recommend that you plant at least 10 milkweed plants. Now, it's best if you have multiple, like we said, multiple species. So if we're planting some milkweed out here, and if I am doing it on my screen, right, with you, there we go. So if I wanted to plant some milkweed here, so maybe I would plant 10 plants of one species. Uh, that's recommended at least. Uh, or... Uh, if I have less than 10 plants, I want to do multiple species. So if you're only doing one species, definitely more than 10 plants. If you're doing less, try to do multiple species of milkweed. And you can plant milkweed uh, that's not native to your area, but it's recommended that you use native milkweed to your area. And here's why, because you'll help other species as well that rely on it, not just monarchs. But remember, we don't want to forget about our nectar producing plants. These are the flowers, right? And we really want, especially if you live along the route to Mexico, you want to think about those late summer, early fall flower producing plants so they can eat a lot on the way to Mexico. Because remember, they're not going to be eating in Mexico. All right, explorers. Well, we've given you a lot of information today, and I want you to go and check out monarchwatch.org. And I'll give you another resource into our third program in Monarch Connections, and that's going to be Journey North. If you want to know where they are right now, you can come track the live migration. And this is a fun citizen science project you can do with your classroom. You can track the milkweed. Remember, they're not going to show up until the milkweed starts to grow where you live. You can track the milkweed and the monarchs here. So it's pretty cool. And you can come and click on report a sighting up here on the map, and you can log in your sighting of a monarch, right? Remember, if you tag monarchs, there are other cool tag programs for Monarch Watch that you can only do that in the fall. Because remember, that's the same monarch going all the way to Mexico. Remember, it's a multi-generation north. So you have to use virtual tag, right? All right, so let's go ahead and jump into our quiz today if you're playing along. Is the monarch doing well? Unfortunately, no, but now you have some tools and resources where you can help them. Hey, how well were you paying attention today, Explorers? We're going to wrap this up in a quick quiz, and let me know right now. How many stages are in the monarch life cycle? How many stages are in the monarch life cycle? All right, four stages, four stages in the monarch life cycle. Great job there, explorers. Next question. All 
right. Remember those are growing in the butterfly stage. The adult comes out fully formed. All right. And next question. What is the only food source of the monarch caterpillar? Flowers, milkweed, detritus, other small insects. All right, milkweed. So when you are creating your monarch waste stations, milkweed should be first on your list. Nectar plants should be second. All right, when do monarchs go to Mexico? Remember, when do they migrate south? Is it during the winter, spring, summer, or fall? All right, they go during the fall. During the fall is when they're going to have, they typically, if you recall, if you were on our first program, they arrive by Dia de los Muertos, right, or Day of the Dead celebration traditionally. But they are uh, starting to arrive later and later because of climate change. And so that's a big cultural change. All right, and we'll wrap up today with... Choose all that apply. What should you plant in your butterfly garden? All right. If you want to help out monarchs, those nectar plants and milkweed. All right. Great job today. I'm going to calculate up your scores. Look for your ranking on your devices. If you're ranked number one today, that means you are today's winner. But first, does anyone want to go out and plant a way station? in your community let me know right now are you planning they need our help and it's not too late you can go out there and plant that milkweed right now all right so we have some wonderful helpers out there that is so wonderful i can't wait to see all your milkweed hey if you do plan any maybe you can put up some pictures of your way stations up at cilc in the creator lab and i can go ahead and tell you if you are ranked number one today with what is that Ten thousand one hundred points whoa make sure you follow up with cilc or look out for my follow-up email and i'll tell you how you can redeem your winning postcard not just any postcard it's printed on elephant poo poo paper that's right that's a poo poo paper postcard and you can find out more about that paper on the postcard until uh next time here let's go ahead and uh i know we're gonna have to close up here in just a minute but if you have to head out have a great day go out there and plant that milkweed but if we do have any questions before i sign off here please put it in there uh hey we tagged monarchs before awesome so if anyone's interested monarchwatch.org is another program you can order tags and because it's one monarch flying from maine or wisconsin or ontario all the way to mexico you can order little tags and you can tag their little wings. And if someone finds it, they can report their sighting on there. The, the, the furthest I have found, maybe a butterfly pavilion could come in for the assist. I don't know. The furthest distance I have found for uh, one monarch that was tagged the day before was found 265 miles the next day. So they traveled 265 miles in one day. So when they are migrating, they can migrate a mile to two miles up in the sky and they'll float on the wind and even going faster than those little 720 flaps with their wings. Pretty awesome. Uh, let's see if we, whoa, 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 so many people here. All right, well, you're all welcome. Have a great day. And we can't wait to see you on part three of the program. All right, uh, I guess we'll just call it there. I don't see any uh, questions coming in besides thank yous and see you next time. Get out there, go plant that milkweed, everyone, and make sure you're taking advantage of all of CILC's fantastic free programming with their community of learning events as well. All right, until next time, keep exploring. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you, Jillian, for joining us. Thank you all. We hope you're able to join the next Monarch Connection program. Remember, you can go to cilc.org slash community, and you'll be able to find that program listed in May. And then you can sign up for those and definitely check out the direct program um, in book one with Brandon Kareen at the Royal Botanical Gardens or with the Jillian at Butterfly Pavilion and get to go in depth with them more on a variety of topics. Otherwise, thank you all very much and have a great rest of the day. Bye.